Okay, and I'm thrilled to introduce to you, we have five folks on the screen. You will be seeing three in person tonight. These are the five authors of the Early Childhood Education Playbook. But with you tonight presenting, we have, first of all, Katiri Thunder. After serving as an inclusive early childhood educator, an upward bound educator, a mathematics specialist, and an assistant professor of mathematics at James Madison University, Katiri is currently coaching, consulting, and researching in both early childhood settings and pre-K through 12 schools. John Almerode's passion is bringing the science of learning to classrooms and schools. John is an associate professor of education at James Madison University, and he has presented throughout the US and the world. His other interests include the design and measurement of classroom environments that promote student engagement and learning. And a professor in educational leadership at San Diego State, Nancy Fry is a teacher leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College. She's a credentialed special, educa special educator, reading specialist, and administrator in California, and she learns from teachers and students every day. So welcome to our presenters, and I'll turn it over to you. Hey, good evening, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are chiming in or logging on from uh, across the globe. Um, Nancy Kateri, do you want to say hello to the group? Hey, everybody. So glad to see you either today or tomorrow or yesterday, whatever it might be for you on the date. <laughs> yeah, delighted to be here and to be able to talk about learning and language and literacy and mathematical thinking with young children. It's uh, interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. The topic we get to dive into this evening or this morning, again, depending on where you're from, we only have a brief amount of time together. And so we want to zero in on the big ideas. You know, it's fascinating. Young children are fascinating to be in the same room with, uh, especially if it's a classroom, to watch them engage with their environment, engage with their peers, and engage with ideas and concepts. And the question then becomes, how can we be more purposeful, intentional, and deliberate in setting up those environments and setting up those experiences to move learning forward. That's gonna be our focus this afternoon, this evening, or this morning. And I'm just gonna stop saying that and just say on this webinar, since time zones are not a strength of mine. So here's the learning intention for our time together. Take a quick look. And what we're going to do, though, is we're not just going to leave this learning intention by itself, but we're going to put some success criteria with it. And so when we're done uh, in about 50 minutes, maybe 55 minutes, we're going to check in to see how well we can explain, describe, and begin to examine these ideas. Take a quick look. And so let's dive into that visible learning research part and talk about the significance of the visible learning research. I want to start with a question and ask you to populate the chat box with this question. If you had to think about your early childhood center, classroom, uh, how would you think about the decisions you made each day? What are things that you do in your center or your classroom that if you actually thought about it, you really don't see much of a visible impact. And what are some of those things that they do have an impact, uh, but it's, it's relatively small? And then what are those things that you do in your centers and classrooms that have a large impact, a positive impact on the learners that you work with on a regular basis? Take a few moments in the chat box and add some things in there. What are those things? Well, <laughs> so Dennis has got us off and rolling. Uh, two hour lectures. Uh, thank goodness this is only an hour, Dennis, but you are so right on the money. No visible impact at all. Two-hour lecture. Dennis has got us started. Ah, success criteria. Yeah, Vicki, uh, one of those necessary challenges is taking attendance. <clears throat> ah, discussion. Ooh, the balance between teacher talk. Uh, no engagement. Yep. Ah, Caroline, social-emotional instruction, a Q&A versus having a discussion, 
Susan, teacher efficacy. What a great, great uh, idea to put on there. We'll see if we can get into some of that a little later. Materials that support play. Kim, uh, I want you to circle the word play. We're going to come back to that one. Everyone else, make sure you have play there. Uh, Piaget in classroom. <clears throat> yeah, early learning or equity, excuse me, equity. Allowing students to express themselves. And so we all have an idea uh, uh, about those things that do have an impact, those things that have a small impact, and maybe those things that don't have a visible impact on what we're doing. That turns out to be the real message behind visible learning. If we were to take those three columns that you just saw on the screen and we were to code them uh, differently, if let's say we were to assign a color to them, um, that would be generally what the finding is from the visible learning database. Here's what happened. John Hattie decided uh, approximately 30 years ago to ask the question, what works in education? The answer was a bit discouraging because the answer was everything. But you and I know, we know not everything works because, well, we're in classrooms and we've had those days where the students walk through the door uh, they arrive at the carpet. They go over to the rice table. I used to say water table, and I can't for the life of me come up with any valid reason why someone would purposely put a water table in their classroom if they could do rice. I'm not judging. I'm just saying. And so they show up at the rice table, and you find out that they act and engage as if they were never in that classroom before. And you wonder, what happened? What, what, what didn't connect? And, and Susan, you're right, sink and float is big, but boy, brace yourself. Um, and so John Hattie did the same sort of thing. He said, this doesn't make any sense. Not everything can work. And so he said, maybe we should look at what works best, not just what works. And so that's how he came up with his barometer of influence. There are things that happen to students and there are things that happen to us that actually have a negative impact on our learning trajectories. And we know what they are. You can think about them, and without hesitation, you can start to list these things. The good news is these things do not happen in our schools and classrooms. Most everything we do in our schools and classrooms have a positive influence on learning. The question is how much of an influence does it have? What's the relative strength? And so those items that have just a small impact, it's not even visible. In fact, in your conceptualization of this, you listed it as no visible impact. Well, those are things that are equivalent to developmental effects. In other words, they would happen anyway. Uh, a student grows and matures and therefore changes. And so we see that in the yellow area. What about those things that have a small positive impact? Well, it turns out those are teacher impacts uh, and teacher effects. Now, let me be clear on this. It doesn't just mean anybody with a pulse. It means your expertise just by showing up has an impact. Let me say that again. This is really important. Your expertise, and Deborah, I just saw your comment about eating the rice and it was totally distracting and I couldn't leave it alone. That's hysterical. So it turns out the rice table, the water table between Susan and Deborah, it's six of one, half and a dozen of the other. But the orange uh, area, teacher effects, an expert teacher just by being in the room has an impact. But then there's that blue zone. There's that blue zone. And these are the things that we do, the decisions we make in our schools, our classrooms, and our centers that move learning forward at a rate that accelerates student growth. It accelerates student growth. But here's the catch. You get the most bang for your buck, exactly. So here's the catch. What is that? What are those things? Well, it turns out they're not checklists of things that we can do. It's not painting the wall blue. Uh, it's not playing Mozart during rest time. Uh, it's not having them use this color or that color. It actually has to do with a way of thinking about what we do in our centers and our classrooms. The greatest gains in learning occur when we see learning through their eyes, which means they have to make their learning visible. And then they begin to develop the capacity, uh, the efficacy to take ownership of their learning. They see themselves as their own teachers. And so if we had to make a list of those things that accelerate learning or move learning forward beyond a year's worth of growth, that blue zone 
uh, the most or what Susan says, where you get the most bang for your buck. Well, here's the list. Visible early childhood learners develop the capacity to do these things. I'm going to let you take a look at it for just a moment. I want you to think about your own environment right now and which of those do your learners already demonstrate? In other words, it's time for a pat on the back. It's time for a quick check-in. Uh, what is it uh, that your learners already do well? Here's a, a brag fest. Susan says they teach each other. Um, yes, that's a great one. What else? Uh, Bernice says they teach each other. Where do you see other strengths in your own classroom around these ideas behind a visible early childhood learner? Student agency, absolutely. Yeah, they do know their interests, right? Yes, they're very quick to share with others. Yep, use success criteria, excellent. They seek feedback, do they ever? They take ownership of their learning, yep, absolutely. Self-awareness, facilitate their exploration, problem solve. It's fascinating to watch children problem solve. Uh, there's a study that was just recently released uh, out of a lab in France, a Stan DeHaynes lab, where he looked at critical thinking and metacognition in young children. Turns out uh, they have documented um, self-regulation, critical thinking and metacognition in babies as young as six months old. They do it. They start to think through these processes. They just don't do it the same way we might expect them to do it as adults. But here's what we're after. This is the goal. And so instead of creating a list of strategies uh, that we are to do each and every day in our classrooms, we should be thinking more about the type of learner we want to develop in our classrooms, in our centers. And it's these characteristics that matter. Uh, but I want to pump the brakes for just a moment. I want to pump the brakes because we're very good at this. Um, in fact, the data on pre-K is quite stunning, except for there is a bit of a fade effect. And so Nancy and Kateri and I want to make sure that we're very upfront that we're very upfront in saying that, look, we're not ignoring the fate effect. It's real. It's out there. Uh, it shows up. There is the preschool fate effect. Now, Kateri is going to circle back around and close the loop on this, but we wanted to be very upfront and let you know that we're not ignoring or we're not sticking our heads in the sand. We're not pretending like the fate effect isn't there. Uh, we're going to talk about why that fate effect may be there. Uh, but for now, we're focusing on building visible early childhood learners. In fact, If you look at the data on Head Start programs and preschool programs, uh, high, yes, um, but overall, the effect size is still below four tenths of a standard deviation. And so while they have the potential to move learning forward, are there things in the blue zone that we can really dive into? In other words, moving beyond just identifying or labeling a program and start to look at what happens within that program. Let me give you a, a great example. Um, Let's say that my daughter or my son, they wanted to play on a winning soccer team. Let's just say. And so we drove by a soccer field where a winning team was playing. And Tessa and Jackson noticed that they all had yellow uniforms on. It would be easy for them to conclude that the way to get a winning soccer team would be to wear a yellow jersey. Just like it might be easy for us to assume if we have a Head Start program, if we have a preschool program, then we're going to have visible early childhood learners. And it turns out having a program is a lot like having a yellow jersey in soccer. It's not the jersey. It's not the program. It's what we do within those programs that matter most. You with me? How did that analogy land? So then let's start talking about what happens within these programs that makes the programs move learning forward and less the, and move away from labeling a program. For example, programs that focus on constrained skills 
school readiness, checklist, uh, finite domains, right? Where a learner, I love this, where a learner can achieve perfect performance. They show initial positive effects and then a substantial fade out effect. So this is with constrained skills, uh, skills that are isolated and just for this year. Uh, in fact, um, you might want to jot this note down, constrained skills. Just put those two words down so you have them. We're going to come back to them in just a second. Instead of focusing on what we call unconstrained skills, uh, these are skills that transfer. These are skills that they can apply outside of the environment. So they build it. They lay the foundation. They build that background knowledge. They build that problem solving. Uh, they work on that working memory. They develop it, that mathematical reasoning. That is how we get to it. That's how we get to it. And so we can counter this fade effect. Uh, and again, we're going to come back to this by focusing on those unconstrained skills, creating a foundation, but also making sure that we're horizontally aligned and we're vertically aligned and help build those visible learners. So before I hand it off, I want to share a couple of things with you. What are those things uh, that we can do as a classroom teacher, as a center director, as an early childhood educator? What can we do to move this learning forward? Well, here are seven big ideas that we address in the Early Childhood Playbook, as well as the Early Childhood Visible Learning Anchor Book. We won't spend time on all of these this afternoon, this evening, or this morning in this webinar, but we will cover a couple of them. And that first one, though, has to do with being co-evaluators. Here's the deal. If I want to know if learners are developing unconstrained skills, if I want to know that it's continuous and seamless and a strong foundation, and if I want to dive into that self-regulation, I myself have to work alongside my learners. I have to be a co-evaluator, work together with them, roll up my sleeves and show up at the rice table, the water table, the cotton ball table, whether they're going to eat it, splash it or throw it, it doesn't matter. We have to be co-evaluators. And that's a huge, huge effect size. When we are co-evaluators, we have the potential to triple the rate of learning in our classrooms. So before we transition to the next idea, I want to make sure we're good on this. So Kateri, I'm going to ask, uh, and Nancy, I'm going to ask them to put in the chat box, what's one big idea you've picked up so far? What's one big idea you've grabbed already this afternoon, this evening, or this morning? Put that in the chat box. Ah, Claire, thanks for getting us started. Constrained versus unconstrained. I know, I love that concept. Isn't that amazing? Um, Polly, it's good to see you. Glad you're here. Vicki, thank you for putting that in there as well. Agency, ah, constrained skills, learning alongside our students. Excellent. And just to think, Nancy Kateri, we're just getting started. No, I love it. I love the um, language of constrained and unconstrained skills because it helps me to name what I'm doing and what I want to do more of and what I want to do less of, right? It helps me to really name my strategies so that I can use them more effectively. All right, so being a co-evaluator co is definitely an unconstrained skill, right? It's something that as a, in life, we want to be co-evaluators with our learners, and um, we want our learners to know that they can evaluate their own learning. But before we can do any of that, we have to know who. Who are we working with? And we like to say the phrase, who before do. We put who before the do. So in early childhood, while um, <laughs> some days can feel isolating, right? You're very alone all day long with your kids. There's also so many different people to collaborate with. So many different um, groups of people or individuals to collaborate with. So in order to collaborate effectively, we really need to know who each of these people are. We need to know ourselves really well. We need to know all the fellow educators we work with, the different specialists, 
the different um, special educators, our paraprofessionals. Um, we also have to know our learners, right? We have to know who they are. And we need to know their families because particularly in early childhood, the families are partners with us, right? And so we place a special emphasis on building each of these partnerships before we even start the work of becoming co-evaluators. How do we first just know each other? So we're gonna look at each of these partners and really think about what are some ways that we can know ourselves and know each partner. And let's start with our learners. So knowing our learners means that we notice and we value who each learner is and that we communicate that value to learners. We say, I see you and I see what you know and I value that, right? And that we genuinely believe that each learner is already ready to meaningfully join and contribute to the learning community. Wherever they come, whatever moment they're joining our classroom, they are already ready with amazing things to share with our class. So what are some things that you do? What are some ways, Dennis already has us started, what are some ways that you already partner and know your learners? How do you get to know who they are how do you value them? How do you communicate that value to them? I love it. Thank you. Dennis says that he has surveys, right? Surveys that he connects with students and parents just asking, what are some things that you're interested in? Interest, connecting that to our classrooms is huge. Celebrating those sex successes, big successes, small successes, really saying, I see that you did that. You couldn't do that before. And now you can. Look at that. You're trying. Yeah. Talking and spending time. I love it. Yep. Morning meeting, for sure. Playing and talking, listening, building those relationships. Absolutely. So all these things that we're doing already are really worth our time. They're really worth our energy. And we have one tool we want to share that we use to know more about our learners. And this, I think, sounds really similar to what many of you are already doing. And so hopefully it really helps you to realize, yes, this is worth what I'm doing. Um, and if you're not, it helps you to kind of think, I'm going to protect some time to do this work, to learn about your learners. So this is one way to kind of capture some information about our learners that we can use to communicate to them, I notice and value you, to notice all their strengths that they already have ready, and then to build on them. So whatever kids are working on, noticing what are they doing, what are they saying, what are they creating, and how can we document that? So making sure that we spend time with every single learner, not just the ones that maybe are quieter, or the ones that are more um, demanding of our attention, but every single learner we want to know and value. And really noticing how are they engaging with things? What are they engaging with? Who are they engaging with? Being really intentional and open and communicating our genuine wonder. So really letting kids know, I really do want to know, what are you thinking about this? How are you building that? Why do you like to work with this? Another one is several people said spend time with kids, right? So the advice of stay, stay and spend time with kids. We have limited time. So one way we can communicate value to kids is by spending time with them, right? That thing that we can't, we can't make more of. So really being in space with them and seeing and hearing. Yeah. And then the last piece, absolutely, Elizabeth, documentation, observation, because in order to take what we know, what we are learning about our learners and use it, right, to make that visible, we have to keep a record. So many things happen in a day. How do we keep track of it all, right? How do we remember, oh, they're interested in this. Oh, someone asked this amazing question. I want to share it with everyone. We need to document that. To so also make sure that we talk with everyone and spend time with everyone, we need to document so that we know, oops, oh, I haven't gotten to spend time with John yet. I need to spend some time with him. I need to get to know him a little better, right? So this is just one way, one protocol of many protocols that we share in the Early Childhood Education Playbook to really help us know our learners and to know that that relationship that so many of you described is huge, right? Just building that positive relationship, communicating the value, communicating the partnership that we want to have with our learners that has that big effect size that will sustain some positive impact in their lives.
It really is so amazing, isn't it, Susan? So having that genuine sense of they're going to surprise me, they're going to amaze me, and I want to learn from them, right? Yeah. All right. Other people that we partner with, we partner with families. So in the same sense of wanting to have that genuine, um, you know, just excitement to know families and to really learn from them, we need to also form a partnership with families. And we have to genuinely believe that every family is an expert about their own child. This did not ring true to me as strongly as it does now as a mom, because I think, yeah, I know my kid. I know my kid better than anybody else knows my kid, right? And so how do we really communicate? Yes, you know your child, please let me learn from you, right? Let me hear what are things that you know? What are things that you want your child to be working towards? What are some of your goals for your child? And to really believe that every family has this fund of knowledge, multiple funds of knowledge, ways that they experience and know the world that will make our classrooms richer by having them share it with everyone. Families are the keepers of their child's history, for sure. Yeah. All right, so what are some ways that you partner with families? What are some ways that you communicate to families that you want to be in partnership with them, that you want to hear their expertise, that you want to leverage all of their brilliance to share it with the classroom community? Yeah, I love Claudia. I absolutely feel that COVID made me actually walk the walk of partnering with families, right? Because my kids were with their families and not physically with me. Yeah. All of those conversations phones, meeting with families. Yeah. I love getting to exchange videos and photos, even just like a quick message, right? Yeah. Fantastic. So one of the things that we share is a, like a way to kind of reflect. What are things that you already do, right? So who do you communicate with in their families and who communicates back with you, right? So making sure that you're thinking about that two-way space of not just who do I generally share with? But who generally shares back? Who do I hear from? How do you communicate with them? And how do they want to communicate with you? When? When does this happen? Does it? When are you across a year making sure that you're engaging in communication with families and partnership? When across a week? And then when, when across a day? And when do they generally respond, right? So you might notice patterns of who is responding and how they like to communicate with you and when across the day or the week works best for them. And noticing those patterns is really important. The where is really important, right? Where do families want to meet? Where do they want to talk? What are their preferences? And then what? What is it that you're sharing? What is it that you're telling? And then what are you listening for? What are families sharing back? What are they telling you and what do they want to know? And after really thinking through what you already do, oops, noticing, oops, sorry guys, where is the focus? What are the things that are focused on us? And where is the focus on meeting families where they really are and truly partnering with them, right? And this was actually that spot that, like Claudia said, about COVID that made me really think about what am I doing that is either my traditional practice, what's easy for me, what's um, something that, well, I've just always done it that way, and what is where I've really changed my practice to meet families, to make sure that we have this two-way communication and partnership, right? I love it. I love that you have a discussion starter on your door, Claudia. That's awesome. Yeah, ask your child this. Yeah, we don't want to constrain parents on how to communicate and we don't want to make assumptions, right? That just because we're sharing something and they're not responding, it's that they don't want to know or that they don't have things to share. It may be the way or the time that we're sharing um, or the things that we're saying. We need to kind of keep trying and thinking of how can we engage? How can we really have that communication together? Yeah. Oh, I love it. How can I help at home? Yeah, but they're not sure. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me that families want to help at home, aren't sure, and our experts are their children. So how do we tap into that, right? They, they have things they want their kids to be learning, right? And they want to help with it. They're not sure how, but they also are experts of their family life and of their child. And so helping them to see that intersection space to really capitalize on those strengths and that expertise is a really powerful space for us to enter. Yeah. How do we make school more like home? 
Uh, that continuity of context is huge in early childhood. And we can really help families to have spaces that reflect who they are by making sure that school is more home-like, right? Where we know them. And having that shared expectations with families is really worth our time. It has a huge effect size, almost double what you would expect. Because when you're truly in partnership, right? And we know, hey, what, what is it that you would like your child to work on? What are some things that are going well for you? What are some ways that your child shows you what they know? What do they like to talk about at home? That is really powerful. I love the open door policy. Yep. I think that sometimes people go, people get really nervous about that. But the more I got open to that, the more families would just come in and read a book and join in the play. And the ease that formed when we had to have, you know, things that maybe felt like more challenging conversations, right? They were easier to have because we were constantly together in conversation. All right. So we've got learners. We've got families. I love that we have this great space in the chat where people are sharing so many amazing ideas so that we can truly leverage each other's strengths. And this is that space, right, where we have to know ourselves as teachers. So we need to take a little bit of time to reflect on why are we early childhood educators? Why am I an early childhood educator? That's my teacher identity, right? That's who I am as a teacher. What are my great brilliances? What are my strengths as a teacher? What makes me amazing at this work? What is it what, that gets me to come to work every single day with kids? And then they have to think about, well, how do my learners and their families see me, right? This is my teacher credibility. So how do they see me? Do they believe that I'm going to follow through with what I say? Do they believe that I'm going to be responsive and welcoming and a trustworthy partner for them? And do they believe that I really can do this job, right? That I really have some expertise to share? And how am I communicating that? How am I doing that effectively? And then the third question, what do I believe about the impact of my teaching for every learner? And this goes back to several people said this efficacy, right? Our teacher self-efficacy. Do we each really believe that we can truly have a positive impact on every learner and that it's based on the decisions that we make? What works best when? Are we making those informed decisions and do we believe that we can make that difference for every child? Making sure that we really have um, thought about, reflected on, and tried intentionally to develop our credibility and our efficacy is really important for us as educators to make a big change in our work for our learners. And then the fourth partnership. So we've got learners, we've got families, we've got ourselves, and then we have so many educators that we work with. Man, when I think of all the people that I have worked with in early childhood in my one pre-K classroom, right? There's general educators, there's special educators, there are paraprofessionals. I work with every specialist, a music teacher, an art teacher, a PE teacher, a Spanish teacher. I have coaches. I have directors, I have an administrator, and then I also have vertical teammates, right? So I work with the three-year-old preschool teacher and I work with the kindergarten teachers. So how do I collaborate with all of these people? How do I do that with some intentionality? So one great way to think about this is to consider four partners when you're thinking about your everyday planning and instruction and five roles, right? So those each of those partners and our work for instruction and assessment and communication, leadership and record keeping. We can think about, well, what are our strengths? As a team, what are our strengths? And as individuals, what are our strengths? I know that I uh, really loved relying on my special educator partner for communication with families. She had such amazing practices around regularly communicating and partnering with families because that was part of her training and part of her intentional work every day as she was working with IFSPs and IEPs. And so really leaning on her to learn, how do you communicate with families? And thinking of how can we share that, leverage that strength for the whole team. We can also think about these partners and these roles and what might be a priority for ourselves as an individual for growth and as a team for growth, right? And for my team, one of our areas for growth was record keeping because we'd often come to talk together and we would have very different ideas of what we were keeping track of. And that led us 
to different paths of what we wanted to do next. And so how could we actually, as a team, be thoughtful record keepers, okay? So as we keep doing these, this work to be partners, we have to really pause to think about what do we know about each of our partners? How can we know more? And then how can we really, as a team, build our expertise together? Because we don't really ever get better at something by ourselves, just by ourselves, right? We have to really lean on each other. And we can lean on each other, just like Dennis says, that collective teacher efficacy, right? Having that belief that together as a team, we can have an impact and we can constantly evaluate that impact is really important. And that has, you know, an enormous effect size that can truly accelerate learning for every single learner. All right, so we have this big idea that we're unpacking that we want to be co-evaluators. And that means we're gonna work together with each of these partners and we need to know them. So there's intentional work we can do to know each other. And that's our know. And then we have to think about our do, right? What are we going to do? So Nancy, I love, I love thinking through that space that my team was in of, whew, we are headed in all these directions, right? And our next step, what is gonna be our next step? There were so many possibilities. And until I started thinking about how we can be a team, I didn't quite have clarity of what to do. And that's such an important idea. And, and thank you so much. Let's, let's kind of keep with that idea of being co-evaluators and also considering as co-evaluators, what is perhaps the most direct of those relationships, which is between the educator and the child <clears throat> and the communication of clarity to that young child is essential. We can't talk, obviously, to young children the way that we talk to uh, the other members of our team, the way it is that we talk to families and so on. We have to communicate with our students in ways that are developmentally appropriate. And developmental growth is absolutely a, a critical part of all of this. One of the the really revolutionary uh, ideas in thinking through what it is that learning looks like is really this articulation of the idea of teacher clarity. And teacher clarity, I, I know all of us have uh, lots of experience around it, is, is sometimes um, narrowly understood as, oh, learning intentions and success criteria. If you're doing learning intentions and you're doing success criteria, you've got teacher clarity going on, right? And it's really much larger than that. It's really an umbrella of some very important ideas that help to govern what it is that we do as effective educators for, for children and young people of any age. Uh, and the first one is around organization. And I don't mean organization of the classroom space, although that's important, don't get me wrong in that, but rather organization in terms of alignment, in terms of intentionality in terms of as an educator being clear on what it is that you want your students to be able to learn and how it is that you're going to build a series of successful kinds of experiences so that the children can develop in the ways that you see that going. And of course, that alignment also relates to how it is that we assess, how do we measure, how do we notice and monitor what that development is. A second element of that is around explanation. Are the explanations that we offer, the examples that we offer, again, developmentally appropriate? Are they within the space of a young child's experiences, whether we're uh, culling the prior experiences that they've had or we're building the background knowledge that they need? That's also related as well to how it is that we use examples and especially this idea of guided practice. We know that simply telling people ideas isn't going to be sufficient. We've got to be able to have all of that scaffolding that's happening. I, and and I'll, I'll turn this to all of you as, uh, as I talk about this as well. What do you see as being so important around the guided practice that you offer for children? What are some of those qualities or ways that you 
ensure that that's happened? Go ahead and drop that into the chat. And in doing so, how it is that we assess, we monitor, and we measure what it is that's happening. For young children in particular, what one of the, uh, the prospects that has really revolutionized what happens in early childhood education is bringing teacher clarity into the early childhood space to be able to articulate what it is that that looks like when we're talking about working with infants, when we're talking about working with preschoolers, right? And, and again, teacher clarity, when we take all of those ideas together, has this tremendous potential to be able to accelerate their learning. I love the ideas that are uh, that are going in here. Uh, Hannah's uh, noting about those hands-on opportunities. And Melissa and others have noticed that you pair that with some really explicit modeling that happens um, and rehearsals as well. Um, another of those revolutionary ideas is that we have moved beyond this idea of teaching to a theme like dinosaurs, right? Or a topic, you know, we're we're gonna we're going to teach about the weather, right? Um, or a constrained skill. Hey, it's a letter of the week. I'm a language and literacy person, by the way. Please, please, please do not teach letter of the week, teach letter of the day, and keep cycling through all of those as well. But we've moved beyond that idea of these sort of um, narrow uh, structures around teaching. And we've really broadened that to be able to look closely at the not only the standards that govern um, uh, what it is that we're teaching. Here's an example of uh, a standard for infants birth to nine months old. Um, but how it is that we deconstruct those standards in order to be able to understand them more quickly. There are lots of different ways that you can take standards apart. We all like the quick and dirty way of nouns and verbs, right? The nouns help us to focus in on the concepts that are being taught. In this particular case, you've got a really broad standard there. Let's focus in on what the concepts are, the nouns. This is about needs, and this is about familiar adults. And the skill, the verb that's there is communication of those needs to familiar adults. As well, we have to look at the related standards because we're teaching holistically. We're teaching in order to be able to think about and consider the development of children in uh, many dimensions, not only that social emotional development where that particular standard came from, but also in terms of language and communication, we often will put children together in order to be able to have those kinds of experiences. Uh, the cognition as well, um, as well as the fine and uh, large motor skills that are needed. So even as we look at one standard, we're giving consideration to how it is that that weaves into um, other elements of what it is that we're teaching. So we analyze those standards, especially and give consideration to the developmental vari variability of the children that we're teaching. What are their opportunities um, for access and, and to be able to contextualize. And here's a really important part. How do we make sure that we are always considering the assets that children bring to our program, their cultural assets, their linguistic assets, their ability and the diversity that's associated with that ability as well. Boy, no wonder we're tired by the end of the day. We have lots of things to be able to keep in mind in order to be able to create these kinds of opportunities. And so we analyze all of those standards thinking about not only the developmental pieces, social, emotional, cognition, and so on, but we're also making it three-dimensional by considering what's the opportunity, the access, and so on. In this particular case, what does it mean to be a familiar adult? Who is a familiar adult to this particular child? And how about ways that they communicate beyond the standard? 
Are there signs or is there is there grunting in this particular case? We're talking about infants um, uh, and so on. Ways that they engage in those conversations with one another. And the clarity in the learning happens with the interaction between the clarity for the teacher and the clarity for the learner in understanding what it is that we're doing together. Another of those revolutionary ideas in early childhood was the movement toward, and certainly Piaget um, uh, and Montessori and others helped us to understand this, the importance of, of guided play, not free play, but guided play. By the way, free play is also very important, but with guided play, Here's that guided practice that's happening because with guided play, what happens is you get to combine the child directed nature of free play, but with the focus that the adult brings to what the learning outcomes are and to what the adult mentorship is. It's more than just supervision of play, but understanding what are those opportunities that I can utilize for that. So when I'm thinking about, in particular, um, uh, teacher clarity and the intersection of this, uh, you know, what am I learning about? Well, in this particular case, I'm learning about the way that colors mix together to create new colors. And so today I'm learning about that. That's my learning intention. Why am I learning this? Uh, that's the so that. All right. Um, why am I learning this? Uh, so that um, I know that I can make the colors that I need or that I want. That's the relevance piece, right? And how will I know that I've learned it? Well, I'll know it when, right? That's your success criteria. I'll know it when I've learned that I can explain the recipes for making different colors. This is just one example of how it is that we look for those creation of those opportunities. And with that alignment, organizing, explaining examples and guided practice, that guided play that happens as well as assessment. I love all of these ideas that are dropping in there uh, as well. So uh, I'm gonna show you uh, two short videos. You know, I realized when Olivia um, introduced me, she said, I'm at a high school. And you may be wondering, well, why is a high school person um, on early childhood? Um, we at our school, we are so proud to be able to say that we have an early childhood center um, that uh, includes uh, infants from the age of six weeks all the way up through preschool, all the way up to the five-year-olds, and they are all our staff's children. Uh, I can't say enough about what it is that that does to a campus in so very many ways. But uh, so these videos are from uh, um, uh, are from the preschool that we have right there. Um, and so I'll, I'll frame this, um, the learning intention uh, for Maria, um, learning about sounds, uh, describing to be able to describe objects and actions. These two children, as you can see, are infants. Um, so they can make sounds on purpose to communicate. And I'll know I've learned this when I can attend to the sounds that others make. And I can make sounds when I see or do something. So let's take a look uh, earlier in the day as Maria is doing some guided play with two of her young students. I just like this one a lot. One, two, three, four, five. You gotta do it now. You gotta push it. Push the yellow one. Yeah, push it. Push. That's the panda bear. Here. That's a giraffe. The elephant. And the lion. What's this one? The monkey. 
Here you try. Yeah, push it. Lots of language development that's there. Now she's got DJ involved. Yeah, push it. Point attention, right? That's an important part of what it is that very young children are developing. Joint attention to an object. One, two, three, four, Build the blocks. Look, this is a red block. One, two, oh. one, two, three. Now keep in mind what her learning intention is because it's also about the sounds, the sounds of communication. A little bit later on in the day, she is back again with those students. I just like this one a lot. One, two, three, four, five. No, oh, I think I'm showing you the same video again. Let me move that forward. That's a cow. There we go. A cow. Yeah. Oh, something interesting happening. Go yay. Go yay, DJ. Go yay. Say so go, DJ, go. Seizing the moment. That's an educator who recognizes Here's a learning opportunity that's happening. <laughs> DJ is certainly demonstrating his musical skills as well. And if you think they're cute, let me tell you, so are their mommies and daddies that work at the school uh, as well. Uh, having that intentionality, understanding what it is that you want to be able to happen with children is such a vital part of what happens in that early childhood education space. I, it, Kateri, I know I haven't left you much time to be oh. able to finish up. I hope you could wrap this up really quickly. No, this is perfect because, you know, I see in the comments the statement of, Oh, I didn't really think that we'd be even looking at infants as an example, right? And so when we think early childhood, we have to remember that goes birth through age eight. And what I love is the universality of this work, right? That's what we know about the visible learning work is that it is true regardless of the age of the learner or where the learner is. And so this big idea that we work together with learners, with families, with each other um, as co-evaluators for learning growth for all, we have to be really intentional for, with that work. And we can do it even with our youngest, very youngest, truly youngest learners of infants. So we can lean back on everything that we know from that who before do and combine it with that knowledge of our clarity and think about, well, what does that mean, right? What work do we need to do really purposefully in order to make sure that we are being co-evaluators? So here's an example from Maria's class, from her in work in that infant classroom, where together her team said, well, we're going to make sure that we're keeping track of what we saw. We're going to keep track of each of our learners and our success criteria. What objects, sounds, people are the children attentive to? What sounds are they making, right? What make, sounds do they um, connect with specific objects or actions, and then a space for surprise, right? What other sounds are made? What other ways might they show that they're attending? And then exactly what Denise is saying, how do we share this with families and partner with them, right? So here are some of the things that, that we have seen across programs, including with Maria's class. So some families send home a daily log, right? If you think about infant and toddler groups, they send home a daily log where they share 
things that have happened, like your nap and your food, but you could also be sharing what's today's celebration that happened, right? Look at that. There's DJ. I can make a new sound. We learned how to blow a whistle in a toy, a toy. And then a space to hear back. What sounds does DJ make at home? Why does he make those sounds, right? So that two-way space and thinking, well, you know what? We could even do that with preschoolers, right? If we have a way that we're communicating with families, we can take pictures of their work and send it home, right? And say, here's what they did today. Where do you see this at home? What shapes do they know at home? How high are they counting? What kinds of comparing are they doing? So thinking about all of those learning management systems that we use, right, as an opportunity to communicate, to even have things translated and allow families to speak back in their heritage language so that we can really have an ongoing conversation. Some other things that you might see to build that co-evaluation space, right? So sometimes families will make, or schools and families will make books that show, well, here's the learning that happened across the book. You know, those like infant photo books, right? This is a space where we can share each day, add something that we're learning. And it's a great space to become co-evaluators with learners too, because even with infants, we can read and share, hey, remember when you made that cool new sound? That was awesome. I wonder what other sounds we could make. That was a really big moment. I wonder who you could show that sound. And similarly, even with four, five, six, seven-year-olds, this is that work towards building portfolios, right? Collecting work and saying, let's hold on and celebrate this moment of something that you've learned and then look across and see the growth over time, which can be photos and can be videos and can be documentation. And then thinking about what are some routines? What are some procedures that you have in your day? So you shared so many amazing things that you do to welcome families into the classroom. What are ways that you might communicate to them? Here's what we were trying to learn today. And here's the progress your child made. And we're curious to hear what else is going on. What else are you seeing? What else could we try, right? How can we partner for this work together? And maybe that happens during pickup. Maybe you have a circle, a family circle at the end. Maybe you're providing ways for families to talk at home. And then, you know, thinking about older grades, maybe that's where you're thinking, what are some really pivotal times across the year or across the day where we could say, come on into the classroom. Kids are going to share what they've learned this year. They're going to tell you about it. They're going to teach you. Right? So this big idea of being co-evaluators, really working together, knowing who before do, right? And then being really intentional with our do is, is so important to do this work across all of the ages that we work with. So there's tons, <laughs> six more, in fact, big ideas that we could unpack. We only just looked at this first one of being co-evaluators. So many more big ideas that can help frame the work that we do to help grow towards visible early childhood learners. And that's the picture that we want to have at the end, right? We want to have those visible early childhood learners. So I know we, we shared many examples from infants. Early childhood educators are the greatest at this of transferring and saying, oh, I see that. I know I could do that with this five-year-old. I could do that with first grade, right? And so thinking across these ideas, how can we build those visible early childhood learners so that we can really counter that fate effect and make sure that we've grown visible early learners all the way through so that when they're us, <laughs> they're still visible learners, right? Even as teachers, yeah. So thank you so much. What a wonderful, fast time with you all. And thank you so much for your generosity, sharing so many amazing ideas. Uh, and unfortunately, we are out of time, so we uh, won't have any time for Q&A today. Uh, but if you do have questions that didn't get answered today, uh, please feel free to send them to us at info at uh, and we'll get those answered for you. Uh, so yeah, thank you again to our presenters. Thank you to everyone who joined us today and participated and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thanks so much, everybody. It was wonderful to be with you tonight.